I'm a Pommy, this is a podcast. Welcome to the Pommy Podcast. My guest today, if you don't know him, then you've probably been sleeping under a fucking rock since October. So, Hamo, how are you, man? Hello. <laughs> Where do I look at? Do I look at the camera or you? No, you, we're having a conversation. <laughs> I look at the camera for the intro and then we'll have a chat afterwards. Right. We can forget about the cameras right. now. Um, if, 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 in, if there is an idiot watching that doesn't know who you are yet, um, mm. give us a fucking 30 second spiel on uh, I'm a stand-up comedian. I went to prison for four months in 2021 for the large commercial supply of psychedelic drugs, mainly <laughs> magic mushrooms, acid, and MDMA. And then when I was locked up, I had time to think about what I would do <laughs> if I could start my life over. And weirdly, the answer was stand-up comedy. Yeah. And we- so I got out and started doing that. And now I'm blowing up as a, as a stand-up comedian. It's going well. Yeah, sick. So talk, talk to me about, um, before we get into comedy and everything else that you're doing, and talk to me about what life was like for you just growing up in Sydney, I assume? Yeah, I grew up in, in Sydney, uh, in, in on the North Shore, a place called Hornsby, and it was a happy childhood. I've got, um, yeah, I just lived with my two parents and my younger sister, and I had three older siblings who kind of alternated between my house and uh, and their mum's house. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, there was five of us, and it was great. Just grew up on the North Shore, happy kid. Went to a private school. I had a yeah pretty privileged upbringing, and and uh, then when I was after school, I went to university in well, Bathurst. Well, what was private school like? For you? Great. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I lived on campus for uh, for two of those years in my senior years. I ended up getting kicked out um, for an incident, but it was a good time. What was the incident? Well, I, I'd kind of I'd snuck a girl into the boarding house one weekend, and um, I had a my roommate was a guy who was disabled, and I had like at the start of the year I had like volunteered to bunk up with him, and so I had said to him, I go, look, man, uh, I've got a girl coming into the boarding house. Can you do me a solid and stay in one of the other boys' rooms? And he agreed to do that, but then when it came out that I'd like had this girl in the in the boarding house, the narrative. <laughs> From the school was essentially that I'd kicked some poor disabled boy out of my room who was like shivering in the hallway <laughs> while I was, you know, having some fun with a with a German exchange student or something. So it just it, the optics were bad, and so I got kicked out of the boarding house. But I was allowed to stay on as a day boy and finish my my finish my time at school. We um we used to sneak girls into uh, military camp in the boot of a car. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so the security guards would come along and they'd do their sweep along the bottom of the car. Yeah. For some reason, never check the boot. Great. So you'd get the taxi. It's a good would, loophole to know, right? The taxi would get 500 meters away from camp and you'd be, or the, sorry, the car, would get, car, taxi, depends what you did. Um, and you'd, your mate would come and pick you up and you'd be yeah. like, I'm just going to get a takeaway and be like, I'm really sorry, love, but you're going to have to get in the boot. And the look on their face is like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you're going to smuggle me into a military base? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, it's good that they were still game, right? Yeah, yeah. They were still saying well, yes. Well, at that point, they're in the middle of the countryside, yeah. so what do you do? You know? Yeah, true. You know, and what, the... you did that sometimes with taxi drivers? Yeah, well, the taxi driver would be like, do you want dropping off at the gate or do you want dropping off near the gate? Because mm. they knew what the protocol was. Yeah. So then you would call your friend who would be like, I'm going to go and get a takeaway. Well, that's what you'd say. Yeah. And then he'd come out down this... Because it was literally a country road, so there's no there's no like lights or anything, mm. right? You're in fucking pitch black, and <laughs> off the girl out the side, straight into the boot of the car, which you know. They, and the thing is, the meat is still running at that point, right? So yes, what do they course. do? Turn around and go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of trapped at that. That's point. a good play. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it worked. But like, I get it. Was it an all, all boys boarding? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So all boys school. Yeah, so fucking... And so yeah, it was. I mean, we didn't have any security, so it was easy to. To do it, but it wasn't until like months, months later that like the, the word got around that I'd had this girl in, and then uh, my my roommate he'd um, you know kind of been grilled and and he broke under pressure. Uh, I mean, we were seventeen, and so like you know, he he admitted that it he'd was not true. been in jail at this point. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like you fucking snitch dog. <laughs> so it was nice. The whole the yeah. whole boarding house full of boys mm. trying to sign like a petition to like argue mm. that I should be able to stay, but. Uh, that was to no avail. But anyway, I was able to finish my, my time there as a day boy, so it was fine. Oh, so you just went for the day and then... Yeah, I mean, I didn't live that far away, really. Okay. It was like a 40 minutes. So your parents just didn't travel. want to deal with you, basically? I asked them. I, I enjoyed it. Oh, cool. I enjoyed living on school um, property, but yeah, so I just went back to being a day boy, so that was fine. What happened after school? Where were you? Pl- what were you planning to do after? Um, I don't know. I kind of just fucked around for a little bit. Um, I studied 
at Sydney University, uh, like an arts degree, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was just doing it till I figured out what I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. And then I transferred from that to do a communications degree in Bathurst, which is kind of like three hours west of Sydney. And that was great. I studied that and had a good time living on campus for three years, made really good friends and just kind of trying to balance studying with the more important stuff like drinking yeah. and uh, and meeting girls. So yeah, yeah it was a, it was a very, you should very be happy. doing at university. Basically. Yeah, it was a really good time. It was like whatever mm. you see in like in American movies with like frat houses and all the craziness. It was exactly like that. I feel like that's what university is actually for, right? Yes. It's... Well, you see, like in Sydney, at, C- at universities in Sydney City, right? It's not quite. It's not quite like that. It's more no. once you get into into the regional universities, it's a bit more mm. debaucherous. Yeah. And so I was very happy that I went to Bathurst. I had I had the best time. Because mm. in the UK, you would pick your university based on the nightlife, pretty much. So that's important. <clears throat> your parents would be like, oh, you know, I mean, I never went to university, clearly, but yeah. um, <laughs> my. Uh, the, your parents would be like, "Fuck, go to you know, get to London one or get to Cambridge or wherever it might be, where it's like the most prestigious of whatever the fuck you were trying to do." Yeah. Convince your parents that you wanted to do for those three years when actually it was like, "I need to get to Manchester. I need to get to Liverpool." Yeah, you've heard that. That's where that's, where that's where that's all where all the hot chicks are. Yeah, that's yeah, where yeah. the hot chicks are. There's more bars. There's more fun nights out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can go to. New- and then you got to and then you got to fudge it around. Oh, this yeah. is actually the only place that has a really good yeah, degree yeah, yeah, that yeah, I want to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bring your parents up to one of those show days where the, the it's looking all pristine and fucking. Yeah, yeah. this yeah. is the one with the most opportunities for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's the narrative Actually, that you're you're pitching, and there's a narrative yeah. in your head. You're like, oh, this is the place. There's there so many a, fucking fit birds. There was a famous one in Newcastle because there was a bar that would do um, a treble for a fiver, so three shots of vodka, like a triple, mm. but they do like three of them. So yeah, three drinks, three shots in each for five quid, ten bucks. That's a, that's a good deal. That is a fucking good deal. And we yeah. like down in Plymouth where I was because I was I quite lucky. I basically had a university life in the military because I got stationed down in Plymouth, which was like a student town, and they had the roundabout bar down the road. And on on Wednesday to Friday they did one pound pints. That's, so I mean, two it's, bucks. It's, it's, rude, it's rude not to, isn't it? Look, you know, that reminds me of being in the Philippines at a bar that had drinks and it was like a, a, a rum and coke was five bucks a double rum and coke was four bucks or a triple rum and coke was three bucks and the reason was because over in the philippines the rum costs less than the coca-cola and the drink no nah. right so the, the more fucked you got the more you were saving money yeah <laughs> it's like yeah, but, buckets in thailand where you get the little bottles of vodka and you just get a whole lot like so yeah a bucket yeah, with about five thousand straws mm. but mm. yeah so I mean, university was fun then Great. Yeah, I had an awesome time. Yeah. Did yeah. you actually learn anything or just like in... Well, yeah, I, I, I went pretty well, well-ish academically. I certainly really enjoyed what I was studying uh, in public relations. It was certainly the right degree for me. And uh, and out of that, that's what I started working in for the, the decade afterwards was, was working in public relations. Mm. And, and I was pretty good at that. And then the whole time I was working in that, I was basically moonlighting as a dealer of magic mushrooms. Which will later come on to find out that they weren't actually magic mushrooms, were they? <laughs> <laughs> they were magic. It but, was just a, it was a glitch in the lab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a placebo. Thing. <laughs> um, so, like, how did you get how did you get involved in dealing? Um, I went to Thailand with a bunch of boys, and I tried mushrooms at um, at Copenhagen Island um, to Mushroom Mountain, mm-hmm. and I had such a good time that I came back and I told my mate how good they were, and he started researching how to grow them. Next thing you know, we were just growing a bunch of different strains. And so I would just go to parties with my mates and we'd, I'd have these fat, wet, juicy mushrooms and we would eat them and get high and have the best time. And so then people would, would word would get out that I had them. And so then people kept asking for them. So we started growing a bit more and I just sold them to people. But because mushrooms like were just these fat, wet, juicy things that taste pretty bad, I... And also the dosage, depending on how much of a mushroom you've got in your hand, could be very different. Mm. I was like, there's got to be an easier way. So I just suggested we dehydrate the mushrooms, get all the, the water out of it, and then blend them up into a powder and cap them. And so we started just selling them as one gram capsules of magic mushrooms. And yeah, over the course of many years, it went from just like a very small thing where I was just selling some to friends 
as just um, to help them out to becoming like a, a full blown business over the course of yeah nearly a decade. Which I, for many years it was just it was tiny. It helped me to cover my rent and going out a bit. But it's like a side gig. Yeah, it was just a side <laughs> hustle, you know, um, a side hustle that I uh, really enjoyed doing because everyone was having such good times on the mushrooms. Mm. But yeah, it was it wasn't kind of. Um, making me a mountain of cash so yeah it, it wasn't it wasn't till many years in when words started to spread about how good mushrooms were and there was just so many uh, events that mushrooms fitted into like we'll be quiet in winter it'd be big in summer when people were going away on camping trips music festivals but in winter we'd have a huge spike around the Miv- the vivid uh, light festival in yeah. sydney so there's all these colorful lights projected on the walls around the sydney opera house and down at the rocks. And so in winter, I see this huge spike because all these people wanted to go and be on shrooms for the Vivid Light Festival. <laughs> just walking around, all these people, all these families Tripping with their out. kids, and there's just a bunch of guys like fucking staring at these colorful lights on the wall. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that was funny to see. So, when, like, your, cor- your corporate life, mm. um, did anyone anyone know at work what you're up to on the side at all? Um, a couple of people that I, I got, got along really well with, mm. um, and it usually wouldn't be like that they know the full story. It just they all they know is that we'd we'd be at a party and I would hook them up with some mushrooms and they know know that I knew how to get them. Oh, okay. It wasn't they didn't just, realize you. They didn't know the scale. Yeah, yeah, didn't yeah, know the yeah, scale yeah. of it. Just know that I could help. I, I I had a friend and I could get some whenever I needed them. Yeah, okay. So it was kind of like that. And what was the setup? Did you have like a fucking farm in your garage or something or it started it? just in my at my friend's house just as kind of like in his apartment in in the in the cupboard as a few trays and then by the end of it it was like a full-blown garage yeah um like a, a just a giant space that was kind of um tarpaulin off and it had um dehumidifiers around the room just to keep the whole the the air kind of heavy and, and moist Full scientific yeah you, yeah exactly with about 30 <clears throat> thermometers through the room just to kind of control the temperature because mm. yeah you need very kind of specific um hum, humid conditions to grow mushrooms correctly mm. so if it got if there was a heat wave or a cold snap bang uh, it could really affect the mushrooms if we weren't uh, able to adjust it quickly because they're quite they're very dem- temperamental yeah yeah yeah, and we, you were using at that time as well, yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. using everything. Like, um, I was increasingly became like a massive coke head. I was eating a lot of mushrooms myself, um, doing MDMA, ketamine, doing it all. There used to be a lot of ketamine where um, I'm from, because my the town that I'm from is a horse racing town. Yeah, and obviously it's a horse tranquilizer. Yes, right? and I never understood it. I was like, a lot of my mates would do it on the weekend and stuff and I'd be like why would you want to inject like or why would you want to take that shit that they put that in the fucking horses to knock them out what's it going to do to you yeah and you just see them crying that... in the corner of the room like you know like what the fuck's going on here see, like, you're enjoying see, this see that's so, all yeah. I need is a pitch it's like this is what I, this is what I give the horses to tranquilize them I'd be like fucking line me up <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. can we have two of those line me up yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, was everyone for the bigger the bigger horses like what's the dosage oh big you know? race horses yeah race horses yeah. man yeah give me is there one for an elephant like yeah. is there one for a rhino where's the fucking rhino kit yeah, yeah so I, I was dabbling in all of that and having a fantastic time for many years until it just uh, got a bit kind of uh, out of control. How did it get out of control? Well, I just became a massive cokehead. I was I, I started by me selling mushrooms. Then I I'd have people always ask me like, "What else are you? What, can, what else can you get?" So I ended up adding other things to the shop. So I sold coke, MDMA, ketamine, cocaine. Um, sorry, uh, and and uh, acid as acid well. Acid as well, yeah. And so. I could handle having the other ones in the house, like without needing to have it all the time. But coke was was the bad one. Mm-hmm. Having that sitting around in the house, I would find an excuse to have it like every day, just like any any excuse. I reckon coke's got to be the worst. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad when you've got mountains of it in your home because, you know, I'd be like, oh, this is new gear. I've got to test it to make sure it's good, and then I have a bump, and the next thing you know, I'm fucking... doing like fucking just ten grams just non-stop like I, I was just i'd go through ounces myself in like three days four days um just pounding away at it and but it didn't matter because i was making so much money from all the other drugs like i could put eight grand of coke up my nose a week and it wouldn't like make an impact mm. because i was making if i was making 40 grand in a week or something like that then who gives a fuck yeah, yeah. did you did you still have the the job at this point 
so I did up until probably about two years before my arrest. To that point, I'd gotten, I'd just become a full time drug dealer, and and I owned a restaurant as well. And you owned a restaurant. What restaurant? It was a pizza store in King's Cross yeah, called Brooklyn Crispy. Store. So you, you were giving out pizzas with a bag of coke. At the same <laughs> time, no, I kept I kept oh. the, the business and the and the um, pleasure separate, mm. right? But. Yeah, the restaurant was was quite expensive just to keep going because I'd opened it during COVID and it was kind of a bit of a money pit. But yeah, so I, I would work there a few hours and I'd go home and just sell drugs for yeah. never ending hours. Were your family aware of this? Aware of this at this point? No, so they they didn't have any aware of any of that. Yeah, yeah. When did it all come out? They they found it about on the same day I got arrested. So it was the fourth of June, two thousand twenty one. Uh, it was a Friday and would have been like maybe three, four in the afternoon. And I was, I'd been up doing coke for like two or three days. And then I just heard this loud crack noise in the front door. And I thought it was like a, a junkie or something like that that had just mm. tripped over. And then I heard, police search warrant. <laughs> I was like, fuck. And so I just grabbed whatever drugs I could and ran upstairs and started flushing them down the toilet. And, uh, they breached pretty quickly after that. Yeah, you can hear them in the house, <laughs> and like I'm just like fucking go. And then uh, they, I just ran and hid behind the bedroom door because I was just oh, fucks. I was like, you know, yeah, you I wasn't know. thinking straight. And they found me very quickly, and they threw me down and tackled me. And and yeah, then they issued me the search warrant, and and then yeah, I just kind of sat there like, fuck, is this is this this is actually happen- happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was quite. It's very surreal when yeah. it happens. That's that reality check, isn't it? Yeah, you're like, sitting there the with cuffs like, go on, and then you're like, mm-hmm. yeah, and just sitting on the couch, on the couch with like twenty people in blue, all fucking taking over your house, mm. and you're just like, wow, this is my life was very different a few hours ago. Yeah, and now yeah. it's actually fucking serious. Yeah, and then you just sit there, and they they go through every single room of the house and every single thing in the house, searching everywhere for drugs, and every time they find something, they just you hear this smug little find. Which is like what they say when they find something, but it just sounds so fucking smug. Mm. Find, and then yeah. like they did that about sixty times when they found <laughs> just different things around the house, and then yeah, you got to sit there as they as they read through it all, and then that was it. Got taken to the police station and refused bail and sent to prison. How long were you in prison for? Only four months, so it wasn't too long, but it feels long when you're in there. Yeah, and particularly when you don't know when you're in remand, it's before you've been sentenced, so you don't know. How long are you gonna be in there for? It could mm. be a, it could be eight mm. weeks. It could be eight years. At the time, you don't don't really have a, a strong sense of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought I was gonna get in there for like six weeks and then go and then go for bail. Um, but then I, I got a call from my lawyer saying like that uh, it was gonna be like a lot longer than that. Yeah. And so you start to think, oh fuck, I, you know, my my idea that I was gonna be in and out is is gone. Um, I better start adjusting to my life in prison because you don't know. Yeah, you could be mm. in there for years. How did you get caught? My ex fiance had had too much coke and just had a mental breakdown. She ran off and told the and got picked up by the cops, losing her mind in some park. And she had like a bunch of cash of mine on her and some drugs. And she got picked up and she told him that I was a massive dealer. And then the house got raided soon after that. You think it was like a? Do you look at it? Back in that was a blessing in disguise, or it absolutely was at the time. It wasn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Making forty grand a week at the time. It sucked, yeah, but yeah, yeah, now I get to travel around the country as a professional comedian, and you know, I, I get so many messages from people that say that like my comedy or my story um, has helped to inspire them in some little way. There was a guy that sent me a message a little while ago saying that he had done some time and then when he got out he just gone back to a, re- a regular job and he'd never spoken about it he never no one knows mm. that he'd done mm. prison time mm. but after hearing my story it had made him want to take more ownership of that to, sh- to share his story to inspire other people so he went and he started doing a public speaking course yeah just to, to start to do that mm. and so I thought that was pretty cool to kind of have people seeing me and being like oh maybe this isn't something that I need to shy away from and keep a secret about yeah, my life yeah. but yeah, rather yeah. something that I can be like hey lean into this it. was this was my past mm. and this def- and this helped shape my future which is a great future now mm. and so now let's talk about the fact that that, <clears throat> that can be done yeah yeah well, we had then Danielle who you know on mm. the show before and she was talking I think this second podcast which really opened up about you know but it, it, it's true right like if you if you um 
hide all the fucking shit that you did that was stupid when you were younger and you don't you know just let the world like everyone does just dumb shit right yeah uh, and then you learn from it and then actually like it you know as long as you learn from it it's not a big deal right yep. if you're still fucking doing it you're an idiot exactly but, but obviously you know like that guy he probably just wants to keep it quiet nobody knows this but actually if you lean into it like comedy if you lean into the the, the funny shit the or the stupid shit that you did and you make a joke about it and you actually you can <laughs> then it it exactly. Makes, well, it, I thought I'd be booed off stage the first time I did it when I was like, I went mm. to prison for drugs and hear some jokes about it. But <laughs> I found the opposite happened, right? Mm. People were like, oh, dude, that was really cool. It's interesting. And people <sighs> liked that I decided to do something else other than go back to crime. Well, yeah. You yeah. know, so I, I got a lot of people come up and say, good on you, mate. That was, that was, that was cool. Mm. And so I found both not only comedy. Uh, comedians but also audiences to be so supportive mm. of me doing it and for me I wasn't trying to glorify anything I was just trying to I, I'm, a lot of my jokes are quite self-deprecating it's just um, I just use that as a tool to, to yeah to tell my story because yeah, yeah. I just I got out of jail feeling quite frustrated and and lost and angry and it was the only outlet I could think about or think of that was constructive was to me taking the piss out of myself were you were you funny before? Were you people say it's supposed to be funny, right? Obviously, it's the material that you're writing. But were you were you the funny guy amongst your friend group? Before? I was born funny, Ross. Yeah, yeah. I, I, my mum was uh, her womb Debat was shaking, debatable um, from how funny I was even in the womb. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, I was just yeah, I was a class clown with a bunch of other guys. But no, there's plenty of people that are class clowns that don't um, that suck at stand up. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So I guess. It was something I'd always wanted to do, but I was too much of a pussy to try. I loved going to watch co a local comedy in Australia as a yeah. fan. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes I'd write joke ideas down on my phone, but I never thought of, of looking up a local open mic comedy night and trying it. I, I, I was like, there's, there's no way. And so it wasn't until I had this moment in prison where things were, were funny and I was laughing. And when I was laughing, I would forget about the fact that I was in prison. And I'm like, this is, that's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, that laughter can be that powerful. And I mean, that's what made me remember that I wanted to do stand up. And at that point it felt like, well, it, your life can't get much worse. You know, if you go out and start doing stand up, like <laughs> you're already at yeah. pretty much your lowest point. Yeah. I don't think you bombing it or open mic is going to make your life, yeah, your life shit, any yeah, worse. Whatever. So I just thought, now is the time to strike. So, yeah, when I got bail, eventually I was under house arrest. So I wasn't allowed to leave my parents' house unless I was in the company of my mum or dad, who were both in the like, mid-70s. How old are you? 36. 36-year-old <laughs> guy who can't you leave the house. You walk around with your mum. So I had to go around with my mum. So the first open my comedy nights I went to, I had to bring my mum along. Um, <laughs> and then you put your name in a bucket and draw it out, and then you get to do five minutes. And not only that, but I had to ask if I can go on early in the show because I had a curfew as well. <laughs> So these are guys I've never met before and like there's like, you know, they don't like to do anyone any favours and open my comedy night. It's like you, you, you get on when yeah, you, you get, when, yeah, when it's yeah, your yeah. turn. And so for them to have to bend over back, when they heard my story, they're like, okay, that's quite that's, funny. They're yeah. like, that's funny yeah, and that's yeah, fine. Yeah. We understand. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was crazy. Like when I think about, that was only like just over two years ago that I, I had to bring my mum along. And then when I got, I did that for a bunch of months and then... I got sentenced in July 2022, and one of the reasons that kept me out of prison was that the judge liked that I was doing stand-up. He thought that that was an interesting uh, sign of rehabilitation, that I was doing that, know. and I was doing well at it, right? So, um, because I'd, I'd gone well in a comedy competition pretty early into the into stand-up, and so, yeah, he thought that was a unique... It was, it was one he'd been pitched before, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, he thought it was quite funny, and then, yeah, I, got, I, I luckily stayed out of prison and been continuing with the stand-up now and it's just gone from strength to strength yeah the so when you're um were you write you weren't writing any material before prison well you were did, I, like, I'd, I'd, write, like, I'd write joke ideas on my phone but i wasn't yeah. writing full out joke yeah, yeah, jokes yeah. but then when i was in prison i started writing actual jokes yeah and then well you testing, got time on your hands right i so, tell my hands yeah. and i would just test them out on my cellmate <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, what about this one? Yeah. <laughs> Do you test them out on your mum afterward? Like, you know, like on a build up to a show? Um, sometimes I won't, I won't test it. I'll just say, this is my new joke. Okay. Uh, you know, I, 
I, it's not always just if a joke doesn't go well with my mum or dad, it doesn't mean I'm not going to do the joke, yeah, right? Because yeah, yeah, they're yeah. like mid 70s, so I might be doing a joke about getting cocaine blown up my ass with a straw. <laughs> so <laughs> they're not gonna they're not gonna love this on any day, yeah. right? Well, I don't know. My mum's from the 80s, so she might fucking right. Like okay. Like, well, like... well you got to know your audience, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah, sometimes I'll just tell them some of my jokes I'm working on just to see if they get get some reaction out of them, but. Um, yeah, it's you, you don't really know with this stuff until you go out and test it on a in a proper room. Right, it takes some fucking balls to just walk out on a stage, right? And just It's terrifying. Like But you at, get used to it. Yeah. So that first experience that mm. you had where you're like you go up on the stage and what is it 5 minute bit or Yeah, 5 minute? minutes. Like 5 minutes is actually quite a long time. Very long time. When if you're, you're talking by yourself, right? Yeah, and particularly if it's not going well. <laughs> If, 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 if you have if it's just nothing but crickets for the first two minutes and you realise you've got three minutes to go sometimes you'll see guys at an open mic struggling and then they'll, they'll say to the guy who's managing the time they'll be like um, how much how much time have I got left? <laughs> that's never a good sign yeah. when someone goes how, mu- how much longer have I got? and they go like two minutes and you're like oh fuck, fuck yeah I just got to stand there. and like well I mean you're allowed to get off you don't have to stay yeah, there the yeah. full five but yeah. people like misunderstand that they're like oh I, maybe I could maybe I can fix this yeah, yeah, yeah. you know but yeah so the first couple of times you do it, it's just terrifying. Like you're not really performing anything. You're just trying to say the jokes that you've memorized yeah. and just hope that they go all right. And then when you get a laugh, you're like, thank, thank God. God. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. The first time, when you get a few yeah. laughs or when, you, when the, you get laughs the whole way through, suddenly you just like, you go from like, thinking I suck, I'm shit, I should stop doing this, to like, I am the god of comedy. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone needs to suck my dick. I am the most amazing guy in the world. You know, I, you know, bowed down. Yeah. And then like... I've arrived. Been, I'm on the, the stage. And then, and then the next gig, you bomb. And yeah. you're like, okay, well, that was short-lived. Mm. Did you bomb the first gig? No, I did great the first gig. Mm. And then I ate shit the second because I didn't realise when it comes to open my comedy, you go, into the, you go to four or five gigs in a week and it's... The only there's no audience. It's just other comedians who are trying to make it in comedy, and so the same guys I did well with on the first night are at the same uh, are at the next gig. So it's like I'm performing my same jokes to the same crowd. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you need new material. So I started time. having to write like new material every night, just to do like a new a new four or five every night. So I was, I, that's it, a lot. That's a lot. It's so having your bank, right? Yeah. So the first eight weeks I was doing like maybe like a new fifteen, new twenty minutes uh, every week. Yeah, and so do, do, do you get do you get to the points where you get like fucking you just sat there and you're just like today's not the day I need to just go and fucking sit on the beach and not think about this because I can't think of shit. No, you, you well you just you or figure just, something out because yeah. I, was, I became obsessed with it. I became obsessed mm-hmm. with learning the craft, with um, me- meeting other comedians, networking, understanding. Um, and every room is different. You know, there's there's different vibes and different energies and different. Um, different crowds and, and, and you'll see you'll see something from someone doing well one night and doing poorly the next night and figuring out why there's just all, all it is is just getting time around it mm. and you just you, you just can't help but pick up little things and that's what I did I just threw myself into it as much as possible yeah because you got you got to have a you got to have a response for every situation like yeah a heckler or fucking fat person down in the front row or someone in a wheelchair or in the even front row it's, or, or, it's, or sometimes it's not even about that at all it's about just your joke selection or joke ordering right it might be that like because of a certain crowd or certain things that are happening that you completely change the order in which you're going to say things mm. or you might say a joke in a completely different way because of the context like, there's all like all those things uh, let alone um being reactionary to the crowd right it's, it can be so much there's so much in that that deck of cards just on on your material mm. What, how do you how do you structure your day now? So you're like, um, is it? Do you have like I'm gonna go meet up with so and so and we're gonna get creative and you know have a drink together or is it just a bit more sporadic? I just, I'll just fucking... sit in my uh, my parents' basement and I'll have j- random joke ideas, a couple of words in my phone, and then I'll sit mm. down and try and write the joke. Right. So it'll be like. Um, Sometimes I have to remember what the fuck I meant by the random note. It'll be like blue pajamas yesterday, and, oh, I'll, yeah, and then I'll have to be like, "What the hell did that mean?" Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I, you know, if I'm half awake and I write a joke idea, the next day it's like memento, man. Fuck I'm trying to like, yeah, 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 just trying to piece together like what was I thinking about in the lead up to it, just to try and. But if there's enough words there, then I'll then I'll see what the joke was was meant to be about, and then I'll start trying to write it. 
and and you know sometimes you get there sometimes you don't and all but sometimes that gets the ball rolling on a couple of joke ideas and then i i try and you know if in, in an average day if i can get one a new one minute 90 second joke that's that's awesome yeah, yeah. and then as soon, if i feel like it's good i i'll immediately look up what gigs i can jump on that night to go and test it the same night same night yeah oh. yeah immediate it's great mm. to be able to come up with something creatively and then getting it and, and, and getting the same and getting uh, field testing it that same day is mm. very very fun fuck that's that's pretty like reactive right yeah. like in my brain like i don't know the audience won't know either right is that you're trying to get in the mind of a comic and it's everyone's got their own way of doing things mm. but like being able to well being luckily being in a city like sydney as well where you've got open mic nights all over the place but yep. Like being able to write something down and then literally go and test it that night. That's pretty. Yeah. And, but, but just because you've done it so many times, it's having that confidence of like, oh, if this bombs, fuck it. I don't care. Well, you, there's a thing with a comedian's called a shit sandwich, which is when <laughs> you have, um, you, you put your new joke that you're not sure about mm. in between gold that always works at okay. the start and the end. So you start strong, they get them on board. Then you try your new stuff. Right, where you've got a bit of momentum, and then if it doesn't go well, you can win them back with your goals at the end. Uh, okay. Um, you know, so sometimes you'll do that, but nothing. There's not no high quite like doing a new five or ten that's completely new, and you don't know if any of it's going to work. And then if it works, you go off like with the same high from the first gig you ever did. You know, it's like I am a comedic genius. <laughs> I am the greatest man alive. I'm a fucking legend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you don't get that same high when you do a shit sandwich, but it's the easiest, safest way. To yeah, test yeah, new yeah. stuff, yeah. but sometimes you're just like, you know what? Fuck it. I just need to go. <clears throat> I'm just gonna package up all this new stuff and just mm. run it because I need to get that high, the highs and lows of feeling comedy again. Mm. Do you think you've got that addictive personality? Absolutely. Yeah, 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 I was yeah. Uh, such a drug addict and gambling addict, and now I've thrown that addiction into comedy, and I'm like, I, I always be, I always have an addictive personality. I just need to throw it at the right at outlets. The right thing. Yeah. Because yeah. Mm. if you, if you do that. And suddenly your biggest weakness turns into a superpower. Yeah. That's what I find. Yeah. So for me, it's changed my life. Now, I, yeah, now I've made a career out of comedy and, and it's two years and it's crazy, you know, because... How do you get through that first... Um, because co comedy is one of those things where, it, like, for most people, it has to be a side hustle because they can't go all in because they've got bills to pay and fucking yep. mortgages and all that type of shit. Like you obviously live in back moved back in with the parents and, yep. and whatever did, did you just have that did you just have that support network where you could just throw yourself into comedy i had a, i had a day job <clears throat> I, I did have a day job and so i was having to work that during the day and then do comedy gigs every night mm. um luckily it was just a job that worked from nine till five so i could go home and then um have some dinner and then and then head out to a gig mm. every night but yeah it's a lot to to try and juggle that and also maintain like fitness and 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 also write jokes, so you just you just find yeah that you have to just try and fit everything together. But when I went to when I went to the Melbourne Comedy Festival last year, I went there for a month, and luckily with my job I was able to work from my hotel room during the day, and then mm. I'd go up on stage and do my one hour show every night. Yeah, yeah. And it was hard because I, I'd do my show at like ten thirty at night, I'd finish around midnight. And then I was buzzing after doing an hour show that went well. And mm. so I'd go to the, the, the festival club where all the com comedians were hanging Catch out. Everyone. I'd drink there till three in the morning. I'd come home, have five hours sleep, and then I'd have to do my day job from like nine till five. Then I'd have a one hour nap and then try and like dream myself up with a million coffees and a hot shower to do the show again at 10.30 that night yeah. and do that for 20, 22 times in a row. You don't do cold showers then though? I didn't. I know. I haven't tried a cold shower. I'm too much of a pussy. I was oh. just like electrocuting myself oh, in a hot I shower. That, I thought that might be one of your morning routines. <laughs> wake up at three, go that'll, for a run. That'll at probably five. In, that'll be in the mix at some point. There'll be a video about it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was that was my first kind of crack at it, and I was like, man, this is this is full on, and it's hard to do. Like, one hour on stage doesn't seem like that much, but when you're trying to mix it with like a day job, and uh, it, it is. Quite a lot. Well, they say, um, I don't know if you know much about Billy Connolly and his background, but he was one of the comedians that launched that one hour fucking yeah. long story, talking stories and yes. shit, basically, for an hour. Yeah, he's a comedy icon. Fucking awesome. Like, if you haven't read his book, Windswept, Windswept and Interesting, it's fucking gold. Yeah. Um, but um, <clears throat> to go from, like, you got to 
five minute bits to learning 20 minutes a week to doing an hour mm. that's like to have an hour of no bombs like in my mind that's like crazy yeah like, do you know what i mean like when 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 did you, the first one was down at melbourne did you do the first one down at melbourne i've done a couple of trial or? shows i've done one in sydney one in uh, newcastle yeah. and then bang i was in melbourne doing an hour show and i wouldn't say like you need to um it, it's not about not bombing um for, it's, it's you don't have to be funny in every moment of an hour show uh, i think you do have to be interesting for the hour, you yeah, have to you be do, funny yeah. for every bit because mm -hmm. you can have plenty of jokes, good punchlines. Then you can have add in the storytelling elements to to move the story along. So for me, it was my show was called Jokes About the Time I Went to Prison, and it was you know included the like just some of my arrest jokes, and then it I just went into like storytelling about falling in love with magic mushrooms in Thailand, and then turning into a, a full time dealer. And so with all those bits, there's bits where it's like there's a story there, and then I'll get to another joke. Yeah. You know? So. Yeah, there's bits where it's like bang, 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 punchline, 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 and then, and then we'll give, and then people have yeah, a bit yeah. of a breather for a bit, yeah, yeah. and then at the end I try to finish it with like a kind of a quite a sincere note about yeah. um, just how I'm, how important comedy is to me and I think to other people, and then finish with a joke. So it's like you know you want to yeah, you want to yeah, you, yeah. you want to move people, you want them to have fun, and then you want them to have a laugh, right? And so you got to do mm. all the, with all those things. You do that in an hour show that you're not doing in in a ten minute spot. With ten minutes, you're just trying to make them laugh as much as, as possible, right? Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. joke, 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 joke. Good night. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Whereas it's yeah, there's a it's a show there's a show entertainment element to it, isn't it? When you exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking, it's cool. It is cool. And and a cool thing about it <clears> is that like you can do stuff in that that is funny and interesting that you wouldn't do in 10 minutes, right? Because when mm. you've only got 10 minutes and you're doing a bit that like takes like four minutes to set up for like a, a very good punchline, mm. but it's like, if it doesn't fully pay off in a 10 minute set, you're like, what the fuck did I just waste four minutes doing that for? And sometimes there's stuff that can be like really edgy stuff, which you just, you need to build trust with an audience and you don't have that in 10 minutes. You yeah. know, if you suddenly, if I'm talking about suicide after like three minutes, people are like, what the fuck? <laughs> Jesus. Whereas if I'm like 40 I came here for a laugh. But if I'm 40 cry. minutes in, yeah, yeah, then yeah, I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah. let's see I where this goes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, do, do you prefer the long stuff or the short stuff? Uh, I mean, I love both. Yeah. I love both. Um, yeah, I, I, I haven't done enough of the long stuff still uh, now to really to know what I'm capable of because I'm still figuring out comedy you know I'm only two years in so I'm still figuring out how to, how to write joke and, how, and, and my on stage persona and, and how to perform but I love both and I feel like I'm, I'm pretty good now at the shorter form mm. but the longer form I think takes you know decades to, to really master do you think that you've hit it off over the last two years because they say comedy is the is the underlying thing that everyone can relate to but no one wants to talk about but they're thinking about it, right? Mm. So look, most people when they were younger probably did some drugs and probably did some mushrooms and well, all of them are still doing drugs. Yeah, yeah. And, a lot, and a lot of them are secretly, but not actually, you know, saying it. They go into their corporate lives and fucking going into the city to their high end jobs and everything else. Or and then actually on a Saturday they they're changing outfit and they're fucking off camping for the weekend and they're yes. taking some mushrooms, which yes. is probably what they fucking relate to, right? Exactly right. <laughs> but it's it's um. I sit and think. I sit and think about it because um, I think everyone everyone wants to make themselves believe that they are this like you know I I have a family and I don't do all these things that are right. They're LinkedIn. they LinkedIn version of themselves, the LinkedIn. Right? Yeah, the LinkedIn version. You know where they yeah, yeah. where they they put up blogs about you know <laughs> their business and all this kind of stuff and you're like I've seen this person shit themselves after <laughs> having too much drugs. Yeah. Like what are yeah. we on about here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There's yeah, like yeah. there's the real version of them yeah. and then there's the the, the story version that we see online and yeah. so yeah sometimes when you when you tell that stuff it's like I'm free to do it because I already went to prison as a drug dealer and so I'm free to, to talk about all this stuff mm. um, and own it and, and, and kind of and put a spotlight on it that I probably wouldn't have like I, 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 there's no way I would have been doing comedy about being a drug dealer if I never got caught, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd be telling the world about it. like, what am I doing? Yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. And it's also like, would people will believe me anyway, but it's like, no, no, you can look up the story. It's all legit. It's like it adds kind of validity uh, and and some credentials to it. So then they're like, oh, shit, this hit, this hit, this hits. When I start mm. doing jokes about, um, you know, our drug laws and that kind of stuff, coming from the perspective of some guy, a guy who's been arrested for our drug laws, it's like, okay, 
now I'm on now I'm interested and I'm also laughing, mm. which makes it you know hopefully compelling enough for people to come to the shows. Mm. Also gives people a different perspective on criminals as well. Absolutely, yeah. Because if people, if you can make someone laugh, you can change their mind. Yeah. Right. I think when you, if you can make someone laugh, uh, particularly when they don't want to like you, then they have this kind of cognitive dissonance where they're like, okay, maybe I've made, maybe, maybe I've got this situation a bit wrong. Maybe mm. I need to, to, to rethink that and and challenge some of my my old thinking. It's which is of- great to have. Which is great to have. If I can make. Um, uh, a narco cop or someone who like has like got this very strong stance against drugs laugh mm. then suddenly they're like okay you know maybe there's maybe there's something there that I need to think about I used to have a really strong stance on drugs when I was younger mm. just you were, look, you were for them? You were for no no, again, <laughs> no yeah, yeah. I, 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 I was really strongly strong, in support of drugs yeah, really strong stance on it <laughs> fucking um <laughs> No, the um, it was it was some fucking weird childhood thing where my dad smoked too much, right? And I fucking hate the smell of cigarettes. Mm. And then weed, obviously, people go from cigarettes to weed to then they end up like coke and fucking everything else. Yeah. Right? Um, so I had this uh, I had this weird stance on drugs where I was like, oh, I I just the smell of cigarettes or anything to do with it was like it would give me a bit of like oh, I don't fucking want to be involved with any of these people. It right? just triggered you a bit. Yeah, it yeah, trigger yeah. triggered me. But like as you get older. And you sit there and, I don't know, maybe you have some magic mushrooms on the weekend mm. or maybe you go to a fucking rave and in Ibiza and you take some MDMA at midnight and actually you understand, like, why. And and to be honest, when you look at fucking shit like this, yeah, this does fucking way more damage than anyone I've seen on totally. MD or bloody mushrooms, mushrooms acid, or, ketamine, yeah. yeah. Probably slightly. I mean, cocaine is still not great, but it's not as bad as alcohol. Yeah. But yeah, I, that, that was the same for me. I grew up as a gambling addict, and also like a lot of uh, around a lot of alcohol fueled violence. And so for me, when I was selling mushrooms and and, and MDMA, I was like, this isn't the problem that I'm seeing in the world, right? Mm. It was alcohol and gambling years, and so that helped me to justify what I was doing in my head because I was like, this is not this is not a real crime. This mm. is this is it may be against the law, but mm. I'm not doing anything immoral. Yeah, and so that's how I made my, my peace with it. How weird is this? That had you had you got caught now, you probably wouldn't have got thrown in jail. Probably not. No, because I mean, that, <laughs> and I make jokes about that, right? Now, and you'd have never become a comedian afterwards. Pr- like, maybe not. Who knows? Bitch. But like, yeah, it was it was it was just the sign of the. It was just yeah. It was fortuitous the way that it went down because you're right. Now mushrooms and MDMA have been legalized in Australia for medicinal use, and so now instead of me being perceived as a drug dealer, I'd probably be perceived as a uh, as a doctor, uh, as a as a medical practitioner op- operating without a license. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. that's fucking wild, isn't it? <laughs> that's true. There we go. It's funny and it's true, yeah. right? Like naughty yeah. boy, yeah. but like when oh. I did it, mushrooms, oh, you're not, you got mushrooms are class A drug, yeah. you know. And so that was the reason I went to prison was because of that that charge, um, which carried a maximum penalty of life in prison, you know. And so luckily, judges have some discretion with that kind of stuff, and so they were able to say, okay, well. Yes, he got done with two uh, two commercial quantities of a class A drug, but um, this is not heroin or meth. There is mm. there is some difference, and judges are starting to notice that. And so even yeah. though it hadn't been legalized at that stage, uh, was judges, judges were still seeing that it was not. It, mm. it was the, the trend was to not send guys away for many years for these for these charges. Yeah. I was. From my understanding, in Australia, I'm the only one I know of that got um, a c- 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 community corrections order, like essentially doing a prison sentence in the community for two large commercials of psychedelics. Normally, uh, there had been some cases where guys had either had a large commercial quantity of mushrooms or acid, mm. but not both. Yeah, yeah. And so for me to get a corrections order instead of prison time was actually um, quite a big decision, mm. right? And that's why the judge made it, um, he, he made it a public ruling he, he, he the, the ruling can be read publicly because <coughs> he wanted to be able to, he wanted people to be able to see this and, mm. and, and, and the reasonings behind it but it was also great for me because then it proved that I um, didn't get such a light sentence because I was a police informant or something right because if it was if it was held if it was like secret documents they'd be like well hold on what did this guy say or do <laughs> but like so I was like yeah release the documents put it out there yeah, so everyone yeah, would be yeah. like oh fuck because there was a couple of guys that accused me on TikTok of being like 
you only did four months prison. That's sus, man. I'm like, yeah, but you can read the case. And then I like a week later, I was like, I owe you an apology. It was like, a- <laughs> I love the comments actually on social media. It's fucking lols. I had a I had a friend of mine come on, just talking to comments. I had a friend of mine come on. He's just like cured himself of cancer, right? Fucking, and he he takes medicinal weed and mm. everything else, right? Yeah. Um, microdoses mushrooms. Like, there's fucking full research on it. He gets it sent to his house like an Amazon delivery in Sydney Amazing. from the places that make it now from whatever factories they fucking get it from here. Yeah. Um. So <clears throat> we're having a friendly conversation on YouTube. It goes viral. There's like 110,000 views, whatever it was, on YouTube, which you know for someone that's just fucking started a podcast is pretty good. Yeah. Um. 700 comments. Like, hope you found God, all this stuff, <laughs> like, going through. Why did you have to curse so much? I'm like, this guy has just cured himself of fucking cancer from taking, you know, arguably, yes, the chemotherapy and other stuff, but mm. also helping himself out with the way he spoke to himself mentally through yeah. microdosing mushrooms and smoking weed in the evening to deal with his anxiety levels and stuff. It's fine for you, though, because all that stuff feeds the algorithm. People people arguing. Oh, fantastic. And it's like, you know, yeah, yeah keep make, making me blow up, you know? Yeah, the best bit is when you actually comment back and you wind the gears up a little bit further because mm. you, you know, respond back like, no, I don't believe in God. And yeah. And the next thing, it's like going off, you know? Fantastic. Yeah. Do so you now- get involved with the comment? Um, yeah, sometimes, usually just to take the piss out of people or respond yeah. if they say something really nice about enjoying my content, then I'll, then I'll, I'll reply. Mm. Um, but sometimes if something goes super viral, it's just, you, you just lose the ability to just do like, it. If there's 7,000 comments, I don't yeah, have the time to go through and reply to 7,000 comments. Well, I mean, sometimes things go, go super like, crazy viral, you know, but yeah. like for the first day or so, I'll, I'll respond as much as I can. Yeah. But then you just gotta leave it. Where where do you see where do you see this like do you want do you want to be doing Netflix shows and go as big as you can like where do you see it? I mean like, I don't know. Man. Love to do? I, 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 I yeah I'd love to just keep doing stand up and just <clears throat> hopefully do it to to more and more people and being able to just make a living out of comedy properly and not and be able to move out of my parents' basement would be pretty sick and yeah. <laughs> but I, I mean I love it now I'm I, I'm I'm happy now doing it and i get to travel around australia so i guess the dream would be to just be able to travel around the world doing it more and and building an audience and and yeah trying to make a a proper living out of it would be the dream and so it's it's heading in the right direction i'm I'm pretty happy with where it is for two years in and yeah if if those opportunities with netflix or tv or anything like that of course i i I would take it with both hands Mm. but um you know it's still early days. I still don't know what I'm doing most of the time. <laughs> Who fucking you know? does? I don't know. Who does? I don't really know how to write a joke. I just come, come up with insane things and then hope that people laugh. So, you know, there's a, there's a big learning curve. For a lot of comedians, I say, like, you don't really get good till you're at least 10, you know, 10 years in. So mm. um, I, I'm not putting too much pressure on myself with any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm just trying to do the best I can right now and, yeah. and see where it goes. Yeah, when you look at people like Jimmy Carr, he's been doing it fucking... 15 odd years yeah and you just see how relaxed he is on a stage totally and he's got every response for every it's a well-oiled machine man you know yeah Yeah, Yeah, it's a marvel to watch these these guys i saw uh jeff ross came in and did a gig in a one one of the comedy clubs in sydney when he was here opening for dave Chappelle. Mm. he just dropped in to like just do a free set just to support the club yeah and man he was so funny it just made you want to just go home and write better jokes because it was just like you're just seeing a master at work yeah yeah i think having like having the confidence to like not make it funny the whole way through and do the long-winded stories and yeah with the punchline is fucking when you watch someone do it like when you watch ricky gervais talk utter shit for 15 minutes to reach a punchline and yeah. the audience are hooked because they're interested the whole way through yeah and you just and you just have so like, so much confidence in your own abilities that mm, you're gonna that you'll yeah, get that when great. you that when you get to the end yeah. that they're gonna be glad that they went with you yeah that's that takes a lot of skill yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. are you um are you writing the longer stuff now? Um, I don't really like plan or not plan it. It just, I just as it sometimes, comes, yeah. You'll write a joke idea and you'll be like that. So I, I have a bit that I do about ADHD, which is like nah, a five. You've minute, got ADHD. Yeah, would you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like a five minute joke. Yeah. Um, but it, and it takes like there's a lot of little punchlines building up to a serious bit and then a bigger punchline. 
and that that joke i only can do in certain sets because i have to like build up enough like i can't just open with it you can't yeah, yeah. no yeah and so um yeah it's really fun not only write those kind of jokes but then to figure out when to, when to pull the trigger on them mm. so yeah but most most of my jokes are usually around like kind of 60 to 90 seconds just short and punchy short and punchy works but it's all you know but they all fit into the, like the broader thing of like just me trying to figure out life after going to jail is uh is is a lot of the kind of the I'm thing still of, still trying to figure it out still trying to figure it out i'll probably yeah. be still figuring it out for the next 20 years okay. so <laughs> we, all, we all are we all are the um there's a guy that on live at the apollo that does a set where he does literally his bits are like 20 seconds mm. so it's just it's it's 15 minutes of punchlines you know yeah i threw a boomerang oh and then it hit me and then yeah. it goes on to the next joke right it's fucking see you sort of some of those guys style. like that's that, that's an amazing style if you if you're at, at the really high end of it the the one-liners i find that sometimes those guys it can be very hard that for them to structure to to do a one-hour show of that can be quite tiring oh, um like for just for an audience to maintain interest so they have to like figure out a few other strings in their bow or be mm. the world best at it to like really make mm. it work because yeah it's fine watching that in 10 15 minutes but one liners when you're like 30 minutes in to a show you're like what is what are we doing here you know? yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a guy there's a guy from liverpool uh ginger bloke he's viral on tiktok and he just does audience jokes so the whole his whole set is the front row and the second row and making them laugh the whole time. He's like, so what do you do? And then he'll go on the story. Oh, what do you do? And then he's got, you know, they'll come back and say, I'm a police officer or they'll come back and say, yeah, you know, I'm, you know, you know, they can't think of something because they've been put on the spot. He's like, what? So you just fucking do nothing. But the way that he does it is so fucking and get to like to find that style. They make it's, it so it's a whole skill so to be cool. a crowd work comedian. Yeah. Is a, is yeah. a whole, it's such a skill that um, there's a lot of, comedians that are either great at crowd work or great at material there's mm. very few that are good at both mm. um certainly something that i've got no idea what i'm doing with anytime like i ask well what do they do for work and it's like oh florist and then <laughs> i'm like oh fuck uh yeah, yeah sick how's that for a job like it's like you know you think it's e you think it's e it's easy and so you try it and then you're like, yeah. i have no idea what to say for that so you know I'm, I'm hoping just with time that i'll i'll figure out my own way of doing it but yeah when you see guys that are really good at it it's it's like just a marvel to watch just mm. someone so quick on their feet is is so much fun when 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 they nail it um before we wrap things up um the i feel like comedy is like taking a new level i don't know if it's tiktok that's done it or or what but i do feel like the it's it's got a lot of momentum recently i do feel like a lot more people are going out to live shows where are the spots in Sydney where people can come watch you, come watch colleagues and other comics? Like, where are the best spots for people that are listening to this that don't necessarily go to a comedy night can come and watch you guys and get involved? Oh, man, there's so many good places. I think there's a Sydney comedy Facebook page where they post a lot of gigs, but uh, there's my, some of my favourite gigs. There's one at the Potts Point Hotel on Wednesdays called the Magic Mike, which yeah. is really awesome. The Comedy Store at the entertainment quarter is probably one of the best comedy venues in the country and they always have very solid lineups mm. that's on thursdays fridays and saturdays then there's another one in chippendale called standout and in, in bondi um this is a pommy podcast i'm assuming you've got some friends that live in bondi um a couple of them, yeah. <laughs> so there's another one there called beachside but Man, there's heaps of gigs. Like uh, I, I post about them on my social media as much as I can. Get out and see some of those shows because there's so. M I, I have travelled around enough now to know. I think that Sydney has the best um, growing comedy scene in the country by far. Right? Mm -hmm. I think we have the most up and coming talent. I think our gigs are the most fun, mm. uh, most uh, consistently. So yeah, it's an awesome time to be figuring out comedy in Sydney. And, and it's awesome time to be a punter going to the shows because there's so many good ones. Mm. Make sure you buy tickets, yeah? You need to make a full fucking living out of this. That's right. Yeah, to get out, support <laughs> it, buy the tickets. Hamo, thanks for coming on the show, mate. Really appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Uh, get in the comments, argue as much as you want to sort the, support the fucking algorithm 